Hey everyone, welcome to the Smart Economy Podcast, production of neonewstoday.com. I'm your host, Dylan Grabowski. This episode of the Smart Economy Podcast is part of a handful of episodes we'll be releasing on gaming and blockchain. In this episode of the gaming series, I chat with Nicholas Shukrun, the CEO of Meta Island. Meta Island will be a multiplayer open world action adventure game that will include Neo alongside other blockchains in its gameplay environment. Within the platform, players will be able to earn in game currency tokens through things like quests and leasing shops. Then users can swap those tokens for others on the Neo, Ethereum, and Binance smart chain networks. In this conversation, Nicholas and I talk about his extensive background in the gaming space alongside experience in the early days of the internet and what it was like stumbling upon cryptocurrency. We also talk about the various ways blockchain will be implemented into the game, such as earning yield through GameFi and a DAO that will one day determine the direction of Meta Island. Just a reminder, nothing said on this podcast is a solicitation to buy or sell any tokens, that nothing should be taken as financial advice and that the host or guests may hold tokens discussed in any given episode. With that said, I really enjoyed chatting with Nicholas, and I hope you enjoy the conversation too. Hey everyone, welcome to the Smart Economy Podcast. Today we are joined by Nicholas Shukrun, the CEO of Meta Island. How are you doing today, Nicholas? Oh, I'm feeling great. It's the night and I started the party behind. So it's a great, great day here. Nice to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be using audio for the pod, but for those who aren't watching right now, there's uh, lighting in the background and it looks like a disco in Nicholas's office. Yeah. It's, I don't do it just for the podcast. I am doing it all the time. And uh, when I'm doing meetings with the guys, they always like me, like, oh, what the, where are the girls? But no, I'm alone. No girls. Is most of your team distributed or do you have a bunch of folks that you work with there in Thailand as well? No, I'm the only one in Thailand. That's my choice. Thailand is a little bit special. It's because I love, the, I love Thailand. I'm, I'm here for 12 years, so it's a little bit my second country. But um, my team is spread all, around the world. We have Russians and we have uh, Americans and we have uh, people from Greece, people from France, of course. People from uh, Kazakhstan and uh, Iran, China, Spain. So we are, we are spread around. And that's a problem because when we want to make a meeting, we are all in different time zones. So, yeah, it's a little bit difficult. Um, m- most of my meetings are in the night here. I don't know what time is it for you, but here it's 7 p.m. Yeah, it's, it's nice and early here, 6 a.m. <laughs> oh, whoa, very early. Yeah. But uh, anything for getting uh, the podcast content put out, right? (laughs) Yeah. In our initial conversations, when I first reached out to you, you kind of briefly shared with me a really cool work history. And it seems like you've always been in the work that you do on the cutting edge. You said that you first joined the gaming industry in the 80s when it was kind of a fringe concept. And then after that, you found work in the internet in the 90s when it was still a very young phenomena. And then moving over to audio and visual in uh, the early 2000s, you came back to gaming when the Unity engine kind of made its way. And then you went into the crypto industry in 2017. And here we are now, you have all these great kind of backgrounds and these cutting edge and innovative industries and technologies, and it's all coming together to build Meta Island. So my question is, what kind of inspires you or draws you to come to these cutting edge innovative technologies? Well, according to the timeline you shared with me, it seemed like you were early to everything. So how do you have your finger on the pulse and kind of find these industries to go into before they're popular or considered like a safe industry? You know, I don't have an answer, but it's become obvious that I have the feeling I am attracted by the new technology. And and most of the time I'm I'm right, but it took time for me to to realize that it's, it's, it's a pattern. When I started in video games, it was a coincidence, I would say. I I wanted to make music 
And, but nobody was interested in my music. My music was kind of uh, Michael Field, Vangeli style. No people, they, they think, oh, these guys were great. They are, but at, at the time, nobody knew them. And I was in France, especially. I was the only one listening to this kind of music. <laughs> and so when I was going to Paris, showing what I was doing, people were looking at me like, uh, man, why are you not doing rock like everybody? And I was like, oh, I like synthesizers. What is this thing? <laughs> and so I realized I will not make money from that. So I was at the same time, thanks to my papa, my father was interested in uh, in computers and he was, but he was not buying them. He was buying the the newspaper. We had a lot of newspaper about computers, but he was not doing anything. Just interested. So one time I had a friend who had a very old computer, what was a Sinclair, I think, it was black and white. So it was the very, very beginning. But when I saw that, I was, it was like a shock. I was like, oh, wow, this thing is so amazing. If, if someone can make a program inside this thing, I can do it too. So I started working on the computer like this, but I was like 12. And uh, I was working like crazy, like until four in the morning, because I, I had no books and anything. And then I realized that, okay, music is not going to make me money, but maybe uh, making video games is going to work. So when I was 16, 17, I sent um, a demo to um, someone called uh, Philippe Ulrich that was, uh, had a company named Air Informatique. And they, in France, they were very famous. And uh, the guy responded me immediately and told me, oh, I pay you the ticket to come, and blah, 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 blah. And I, it was such a difference between the music industry and the video game industry. I thought, wow, these people, they want. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to continue to make music for fun, which I'm still doing. I've made a lot of albums that are very weird and nobody cares about it. But I love it. <laughs> I don't have to make money from that. So I do only what I like. But the video game was quickly, uh, it was obvious that it will be my, my profession. So as soon as I got my bachelor degree, I, I thought like I was boring and I wanted to go to Paris because I was in Montpellier, like 1,000 kilometers away. And that was the good... So, I, well, I found easily a job in the game industry working for Ubisoft. That's how I, I started. And then, step by step, every time I reach a certain level in each uh, of this industry, I got bored. Like, for example, in the video game industry, I got Ubisoft and Cryo, then I did... Uh, I was, for 10 years, about maybe 12 years, I did... Uh, I think five video games by myself. And I, I was producer of, of a lot of video games. I don't have my name into it because at this time we didn't care about it. Had many people working, I was producer, but I didn't check my name in the game. But I had a lot of experience. And when I did Alien, which was with Fox, and uh, it was a very big license. And uh, when, when the game was finished, I was like, what well, I can do better than that? Had first page of PC Gamer, have everything, television, whatever. So then I was interested in the internet, and I thought, okay, I want to do a network game. But at this time, can you imagine it was 1960? <laughs> so my boss told me this thing I will always remember. He told me, oh, internet is not going to make money. Everything is free on the internet. At this time, it was before Internet Explorer. It was CompuServe. <laughs> And and I thought, oh, I don't care. I'm going to learn that. And I stay one year uh, with my wife looking at me like, when are you going to go work again? <laughs> Learning the internet. And that's how I make my website. And later on, I sold the website one for $5 million. Wow. <laughs> and then I was like, what are you going to do now? <laughs> you know? Then I moved to to the audio industry because I like I love music. And it was the burgeoning starting of, of all these virtual instruments that were like, wow, that's crazy. I'm a programmer. I'm a musician. I have to do that. So I create a company and I make like 30 or 40 of them. And it sold, sold very, very well. And because it was the very beginning, I have customers like Hans Zimmer who are buying my thing because this is the kind of guy who, who is at the top of everything. You know, if something new happened, buy it. So he, he was buying my stuff. And when Unity started, I was like, I was working on 3D because my, my idea to do a video game again was still here. I wanted to do something again, but I wanted to do it in 3D. But at this time, you, you had to do it in you know, PC or on Mac. You will not have something that will 
manage the same project and then you can do it for mobile, PC, Mac, you know, you had to do a completely different game. That was a mess. But Unity happened to, to make this uh, technology possible, but it was on Mac. So I waited. <laughs> I waited that they make the PC version. And as soon as they did the version 2.5, I think I buy it. And I started to sell stuff on the uh, asset store. And so, you know, it's not conscience, but it's just a, a way like this. And because I was doing Unity, I had a lot of customer from the asset store. And one customer, one day, told me, you know, you should do the ACO. And I was like, what, an ICO? What, a, what, what is that? He, he told me, okay, I, I'm going to tell you everything. So he, step by step, this guy who was a customer uh, doing shaders on Unity, he just he teach me how to do a solidity contract, basically. So I went to the Stratus things, Omaze Go, at the very beginning in 2007 or 16. And I thought, wow, this thing is dope, you know? I need to do something like this. So I did a project in Solidity. Uh, it was 10x, but the press release is already you know, on the web. And then I thought, hmm, if I want to understand really the core of the crypto, I need to understand Bitcoin. That's why I, I found a minister and I worked two years on the blockchain, which forced me to go back to C++. Oh, it was horrible. That was very complicated. I can't help. Spend weeks trying to understand what Satoshi did. This guy is crazy. And I learned how to make a blockchain. And then I thought, okay, video game, blockchain, well, why not put them together and make something that will drag the player into the crypto that way? That's how I started to make Meta Island in 2021, saying, okay, I'm going to do it seriously. I'm going to do another game, but this time I'm going to do it by myself with my investors. No compromise on quality, no Ubisoft. And because this company, they basically, they don't make you rich, you make them rich. So you're always running after the budget and you're always disappointed by what you're doing because they never give you enough. But the crypto, the magic of crypto is that it's, right, you have your budget, you, you have the money for doing what you dream about. That's the first time I actually I really have. So here I am doing crypto and GameFi and all these kind of things. And I so I'm doing some music too in the game, like just for fun. That's really cool. It seems like crypto and blockchain was kind of the final step that allowed this vision of yours to make the game come to reality. Is Med Island something that you've been thinking about for a long time? And you just had this vision of a 3D open world where players can interact and move around and party or, or join quests. And the advent of the technology, Unity and cryptocurrency made it possible for you to finally get this vision out of your head? Or is it just the culmination of everything that's available and then you had this idea to create Meta Island? Actually, you know, I, I wrote a script for a video game for Ubisoft in the 80s. And this script was named Adam and Eve. And the, and the story about that was that you were starting with Adam and Eve and they were making babies and you were like a goat. And you, it was an open world where all these people, they were making a village and then they were praying to you because you're the goat. And all of that has been written at this time, but it was impossible to do it technically. It was very complicated. And Ubisoft, they, they just throw the, the script there. Uh, what is that? And so this idea has come from a long, long... And the, no, the tech, there are two things that make it possible. Of course, 3D. Unreal is amazing. It's the best tool I ever used for making video games. It's uh, much better than Unity. It's more complex as well. That's why a lot of people are doing uh, Unity games because it's faster, cheaper. And, but when you start to, to master Unreal, I mean, only your imagination is the limit, you know, because it's working, it's stable, it's beautiful, out of the box. It makes your idea shiny. And secondly, of course, crypto. I mean, crypto brings something new that's going to change the world because it gives to a lot of creators the finance to do what they imagine. It's going to make something about the creativity. It's going to change a lot of things. Do you think that? 
crypto is going to enable more AAA kind of games. And from my understanding, AAA games are kind of just the mainstream quality type of games that we've grown to love and play, like Halo, Fortnite, just high quality games like this across PC, Mac, console. Do you think that crypto and ICOs and people able to fundraise are going to be able to provide these types of games? You know, you have decades of experience and you understand the way that the gaming industry works and funding and you're your own artist and a programmer. So you're kind of put into this unique position where you can leverage all these skill sets that you have and take advantage of the opportunity because you know what it's like to work with a budget. But what about kind of the new game developer who they did a really good job fundraising, but they don't understand budget, timing, scope, things of this nature. Do you think that we're kind of still in too early of a phase where if somebody fundraises up to $10 million, what if they run out of their their funding too quickly because they don't have that experience? Is this something that you think people can kind of work past? You know, if you see the story, every time there was a real change, how do we say that? Like when the train came first, there was always a abusive use of funding and, and all of this kind of thing. And uh, it happened with internet. If you can remember, I was in the startup when it happened. We were buying websites and we were the number of views using all kinds of tricks. We were making a lot of money out of it. And one day people realized <laughs> that was all fake and it crashed very badly. And uh, I think crypto is the, the same thing. There is so much excitement that all the opportunists are going to come and say, oh, I have a great idea. Here is a pitch deck, mm. blah, 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 blah. And because nobody knows what, what is Metaverse, for example, they're going to say, oh, this uh, boxing game is a great Metaverse. Boom. Put 10 million on it. And people are going to lose money. But out of that, it's like the sea. You have the, the water, you have the thunderstorm, and, and then getting quiet, and from what will stay will be the, the future of gaming. They will be the, the future universal. Because you, you see in all this uh, revolution, the old guys never win. It's new people who come in, like Google, Amazon. They were coming from scratch. Nobody from the world before did millions. It was new people. But the first one never win. The first one who come with the first idea, they usually like an mp3.com or maybe Axie Infinity. They, they are the first one. They have a lot of success, but they are not strong enough to become the Google or other. So there is a need of fight. There is a need of a mess. And from that, there will be some genius people who will come from that. When, when people say that the metaverse is an industry that will represent about 13 trillion uh, in 2030. It's a big bank who'd say that. You can imagine if a meta island just have one person of that. I can give the rest to Microsoft. But what I see is that all the gaming industry does not understand the crypto. They try, but they, look what Ubisoft did. They did their NFT thing with uh, Ghost Recon. That was terrible. The press, the players, everybody rejected it. And now I talk with them because we are doing NFTs, we try to make something with them. And they, they don't want to communicate about crypto because they're scared to lose their core players, audience. They want to be ready when they go to crypto. So what what this mean? This means that these people don't know how to make a crypto project that work. If you compare with what SL2, my investors are doing with Nitro League, Players don't know naturally, but it is $100 million project. And uh, Terra Virtua, who knows Terra Virtua? Well, the investors know because they make 100x at Binance, but players, they don't know about it. So it's a totally new industry with new players. And I think that the people who are, will have the greatest success will come from the crypto industry. But right now, I don't see too many people who can, like us, mix the, all the capability 
that is uh, doing a real great game, a real great entertainment, because it's not only game, it's a story, it's, and also a great uh, crypto project that will be liked by investors. It's not easy. Yeah, it seems that the crypto games that will survive come from folks like yourself who have a background in gaming. But this is also a chicken and the egg sort of thing because people who understand crypto might not necessarily have come from the gaming background. So how do you create a really sticky, great game that a regular gamer will use, not necessarily somebody who's interested in crypto? It's a really kind of tricky question right now because Axie Infinity, it seems like those guys understood how to integrate blockchain and NFTs into the game, but the game is still very basic right now. And it's fun you know, at first, but the novelty wears off really quickly. And that's something that I think is really cool about Meta Island is that you're bringing this really well-developed world that looks like it's just going to be fun to play. I kind of get like Fortnite, Halo kind of vibes, mostly because that's what my understanding is of these types of games. And it's not necessarily kind of laggy stick figures like Axie Infinity looks like. So it's going to be really interesting to see this kind of play out over time. Now, something that I think is becoming more and more interesting is this use of the word metaverse and use of the word GameFi. What is GameFi? And how does it differ from other games that are out there? You know, like I can trade items on third party marketplaces, even though they're not necessarily crypto. So, how does GameFi kind of become a concept that changes the gaming industry? Well, first of all, uh, GameFi and Metaverse are two different things. GameFi is, from, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, be careful because I'm not a specialist. So you can have a wrong answer from me, but that's my personal opinion. There is the DeFi. So it's the finance, crypto finance, decentralized sometimes, try to be decentralized. The thing is that as soon as you give to the people the, the power of their finance, it changes everything. Because actually, the, all the players in the finance, they are making a lot of money. They give you just a small piece of the cake. And so as soon as you, you understand that how the DeFi is working, like just you participate in some liquidity pool, you, you're stacking a little bit, you realize that there is a lot of money to make beyond what the banks can offer you. If you block your money for one year, for example, they're going to give you 2%. Come on, you can do 2% a month uh, by very easily if you control everything. So what the crypto does is give the control of finance part, the users, the, the, the one who own the money. And so that, that's what Satoshi uh, said in white paper. He said, well, we just uh, removed the third party that, uh, and we replace it by mathematics. The mathematics don't get, well, they get a commission, but <laughs> it's not like a, the banking industry that feeding from your money and make it all these billions that should be in your pocket actually. So the game file is just applying this to gamification. You you pay a game and instead of having uh, I don't want to say always the same name, but the big company, you know, all these big company, gaming company, they are worth a lot of money. But how many employees there? I mean, the, the, the one I know whose name is starting by a U, <laughs> they have 19,000 employees. That's ridiculous how many games they are making. So this costs a lot of money. Where do they get this money? They get the money from the license they are making. And then who had the idea to make these games? Whoever had the idea to make this game, they are not getting it. So the game file is giving the opportunity to creators who are making games to become rich, sometimes immensely rich, uh, which I think it's deserved if you create the game. So that's the, the interesting thing. The, the second thing is what is the metaverse? So a lot of people are using the word metaverse, okay, 
we are making a boxing game, it's a metaverse. We are making a football game, it's a metaverse, blah, blah, blah. What I see is that there is no metaverse existing today. And uh, you can see uh, Facebook, they try, they have all the money for that. They have all the, they communicate like crazy, they even change their name, and it's, it, it's a failure. Nobody wants to go there. So maybe it's not that old. Maybe you, you cannot just take something and say, oh, this is a VR application, it's a metaverse. People are not stupid. What they want, metaverse. And metaverse will exist. But it will not be a supermarket. It's a Amazon cover that, or Lazada, or uh, Alibaba. I mean, you will never have something more easy to use than a search engine. You, you type what you want, you have the picture, you click, you buy. I mean, if you have to walk and find a pan, and try to fit it to your virtual avatar, well, good luck with that. And secondly, everybody is going in the wrong direction. I think. They think that the metaverse has to be a VR. Well, that's because of the VR industry failed. <laughs> they tried to sell their VR headset and everything, and people, they got like, oh, well, okay. It's good for attractions. Like you go five minutes in the, in the place where there are some, you know, and you, you pay uh, 10 bucks and then you, you do it five minutes and ha ha ha, it was funny. Oh, I almost puke. So uh, <laughs> it's like a roller coaster. Yeah. The same thing. You're not going to have a roller coaster in your garden and do it every day for five hours. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that. So, but they want to sell their headset and so they thought, oh yeah, Metaverse, ah, we, we're going to sell our stuff. We just have to rename that, that Metaverse. No, it's not going to work because it didn't work before. And also, VR is making you sick. I mean, if you test it, it's really intense. It's really amazing. But after 10 minutes, you're like, oh, I'm going to die <laughs> if I continue to do this. thing. too intense. So I think they are going in the wrong direction by making it like uh, mandatory that you will have a VR headset. That's why Meta Island is going to work on whatever. Maybe VR in the future, but first we are doing on the screen. So And, and they are going in the wrong direction because also, they are all, all these companies are globalist. And they, they have the same opinion about, okay, we are going to do something and billions of people are going to play with it and we're going to control that. This is the opposite of what the crypto is. This is super centralized. Twitter is super centralized. Facebook, Instagram, everybody is, is fed about that. Now you play with YouTube and you have to see a, an advertising of a car while you're looking something that's totally different and you have to wait 15 seconds. People are fed about that. So I think the metaverse should be, and that's my vision of that, should be something that's the opposite of what people are doing. It's a safe place for your brain, safe place for your finance. It's a place where you're not going to have someone who is checking what you're doing can stop your money because you say something wrong, et cetera, et cetera. That's why a meta island it's designed it in a way that nobody can control, supervise it. It's, uh, each island is 1,000 people, so whatever happened in one island is not going to change the world. You know? Che Guevara is not going to come in an island and make a speech. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So then, therefore, there is no need of uh, supervision from uh, the FBI or whatever. It will be impossible to track what's happening in Meta Island. And uh, I think that people, they need to have uh, proximity and something that is more tailored to their culture, their language, and be the opposite of what Twitter and everything does. That's where I'm digging. Hopefully people will like. I think it's resumed the, the idea. You see. So you kind of alluded to it in what you were just saying, but something that I've seen in a lot of the conversations and outreach you've done is Med Island is going to have this toxic free environment. And I kind of get the idea that you're talking more at like a global level, like toxic free, meaning we're not having the opinion of some sort of mainstream media uh, kind of, you know, putting that into our, our minds or enforcing it into the gameplay or into the environment we live in. So that's kind of like the bigger scale. But when you're also talking toxic free, are you also referencing kind of like the crappy behavior that people can have online? What do you mean when you say uh, Meta Island is going to be a toxic free environment? If you take Meta Island and you see the picture, you think, okay, it's like a Far Cry kind of game. But if you think about it at a deeper level, Meta Island is not a game. 
in the sense that there is no script. You're not going to be in a place and people are going to say, oh, you need to do that. Like GTA, you, you have a feeling of open world, but actually there, there is a script. You know that if you want to go to this point, you need to go to this villa and talk to this guy, bring him this thing for this place, blah, blah, blah. So there's a, a script. Every game has a script. But if you take me to Iceland and you see how it's designed, it's designed to be a an alternate reality. And what makes that possible is crypto. Because if you have a real economy, economy is the spine of uh, every society. So if you have a real economy, and then on the top of that, you create a social system with different ranks, and you can improve your rank by helping people, blah, blah, blah. Then you close to have a simulation of a world. It's, it's more than just a game. So the experiment here is that we are going to put players in situation where they they have to decide by themselves what they're going to. We have some gaming mechanics, for example, the Iceland need to be taken care of, otherwise it's dying and everybody loses everything and it's, it's starting. So there is a motivation to say, okay, if we stay on the beach and we just uh, throw that each over and do some stupid thing, then it's reset. Okay, let's get organized because there is a play to earn and you don't want to. To lose this opportunity to make some money, you know? so toxic free for me is is to create an alternate reality where you are not bullied, where you are not insulted, or you are not a slave. I mean, you work all day. I mean, reality really stuff. You, if you take the COVID, you take the inflation, you take the war, you take. I mean, it, there is a pile of crap, and people have to handle that all day. Most people have problems with their wife or kids because they don't have the time to take care of them. And the uh, education is not, and blah, blah, blah. And, I mean, reality sucks. If you think about uh, Adam and Eve, when we come as cavemen, we were able to wake up at the time we want. <laughs> okay, we didn't have medicine, but we were very cool, you know? That was a great life. And now the life we have is ready. So how we can experiment a different kind of society? We cannot do it in real life. You, you cannot say, okay, I'm the president of this country and we're going to change everything. We are in the global world, but beta is in this kind of simulation where we're going to experiment things. And I think that people are going to be happy to have their second life because Meta Island is a simulation about the weather, it's a simulation about animals, about people walking, jobs, and economy. And there is a lot of things that are connecting with the real world without the negative. So I think people after work, they're going to have the choice, okay, and it's not only about Meta Island, it's about the future of the Metaverse. They're going to have the choice, okay, do I look CNN or uh, CNBC or whatever for news? I'm going to be depressed after that, for sure. You can see how many people take medicine, take antidepressants in, in the US. I, I checked that, 41%. I mean, that's crazy. It's, it's a crazy number. So people are sick of it, but they have no alternative. Actually, you, you don't have the choice. You have to live and you have to, to accept. So the idea is to say, okay, Metaverse is going to be something different that's going to be close to reality enough so that you can connect on it, where you can make money, which is a real motivation, where you can run a business, which is another motivation, and when it's going to, you're going to be more happy, just you're going to be yourself. You're not going to play a role because you're scared or anything. You can be yourself. And if you're not happy in this Iceland, you go in another way. And you're just going to be what you want. And what is the alternative after you work? Well, you, you can look the television or you can play a Metaverse. I think Metaverse is going to have some success. That's very much a Ready Player One sort of future that you're kind of preparing for. Yeah. I remember this movie, but there was some uh, scary thing in this movie. <laughs> the, the thing is, Ready Player One was uh, global. As soon as you are local, you're with 1,000 people max. It's like your neighborhood. Yeah, that's really cool. So thanks for kind of breaking that down. It seems like your concept of toxic free is very kind of like large scale, but then at the same time kind of narrowing in. But there is one thing. Players like to destroy everything. And people come to, yeah, it's real fun. I love it. So I have a lot of people come to me. Where, well, if, if I want to kill everybody, if I want, it's like a motivation to be the best one. You know, you kill everybody, wow, well, I'm the best. 
my answer to that is you, you have so many games that can do it. You have many choices to do it. <laughs> but I don't want to go in that direction. I'm going to do something else with the hope that a lot of people are going to think, okay, I cannot help the planet. I feel powerless. But I can be in this small place where there are some people I know because I talk with them. And I want to help them get more money. And that's my motivation. So it's going to be something different. But it's not going to be something where you, you can have negativity, like killing all the people. If there are animals, you're not going to kill them. I mean, why? Killing a small dog, you know? It can be fun, but you can kill the fish because they are mutant. They are big. Yeah, so something that is really interesting that I think cryptocurrencies inherently have is that they're free market, that anybody has access to them across the world as long as you have a mobile wallet and a cell phone. So in Meta Island, it sounds like while you can kill everyone and you can kill animals for no reason, that maybe these free market principles, if people can buy into them together, then they'll be incentivized to participate in the journey, participate in the script, and really work together to move forward. Exactly. So that's kind of uh, something that's really interesting about how cryptocurrency and blockchain makes this possible. So. I want to be respectful of your time, so I kind of want to wrap up, but I want to hear more about how you're integrating just blockchain in general into the game. You have the ISL token, you have the walk currency, and then there are also NFTs. So I know that this could probably be a multi-hour conversation, but what are the ways that you're integrating blockchain technology into the game across just tokens and across NFTs? Could you just kind of brain dump that on me? Actually, the game is really built around crypto. I mean, crypto is the core of, the core of the story. When you read the story, you realize that all the problems that happen in the world come from the crypto crystals that are changing the DNA. And that. So all the superpowers come from crypto. So in the game, there is crypto everywhere. And it's come in different uh, fashion. First, of course, there is the, the local crypto. You see some crystal, you can take them. You have crypto. It's worth nothing. No, you can convert that to the local currency because you need to eat, you need to drink, otherwise you're dying. So there are some things you need to do, have a rent. The walk is the local currency. It's a stable coin because I don't want people to buy a beer and the price of the beer change all the time. <laughs> so a beer is 30 bucks, well, 30 walk. A walk is a one third of a dollar at the beginning, then it's going to divert depending on what the dollar is doing. But the price inside the metaverse are, are not going to pay. So it's a stable coin. And it's interesting to think that I'm creating a stable coin that is not uh, bind to a real current. I think it's the first time. Because if you think about it, USDT, everything is bind to dollar, euro, whatever. But here we are creating an economy with a social system and a stable coin that is based on this economy. That's a pure stable coin based on crypto. And it's interesting to see how far it will go. Because if you have 1 million people working, playing with the game, then we will have an economy with a stable coin that is going to be like, well, a small country currency, you know. So, yeah, that's interesting. But the work is only to use internally for now. So, okay, you find your crystal, you have in your inventory, then you can convert the crystal. And then that's when the uh, cooperation comes useful. Because depending on how you convert that, you can make a lot more or a lot less. And people are smart about making money. They're going to understand quickly. Like, for example, if your rank in your social rank is high, you're going to get more money from this crystal. And if you have a specific NFT, that's the red card NFT, the red cards are the lucky guys, then it's going to be more than that. Because people can tip each other. They're going to think, okay, we have one guy who is run five, and he has red card thing. We're going to tip him. We're going to give him the crypto, and we're going to make like twice more. There, there are a lot of mechanisms that are uh, working in the game that people will discover if they are smart. And they are going to talk about it in YouTube because it's real money. You know? So as soon as it's real money, you find something it's worth some, something. You know? So I'm confident that people are going to like so, okay, you have your crystal, whatever the solution, you convert it into work. Now you have work. What you can do with work, you can buy in the game, whatever, food, fireworks, 
weapons. But you can also send it to your wallet. How you do that? It's working, actually. You can go into your ID, your profile, and here you have you have uh, Neo Binance Ethereum and ISL. Or that's the four coins we are supporting. And then you can just say, okay, I want to send it to this address. Boom. Work is converted into ISL. ISL will be will have a value. So then at this time there is a there is a conversion that that's gonna be different depending on how the value of ISL. Then you convert to Neo, then you convert to whatever, and you send it to your wallet. You pay only the fee to receive the money. You don't pay the fee to send because uh, we are bridging. So basically, you find crypto, you take it, you convert it to work, you go into your profile, and you send the work to your Neo wallet, and it's working. We are doing it on test. And then the problem is, where this money come from, actually? <laughs> because you find the crypto, someone has to pay that, you know? And it comes from the owner of the egg. Actually, the owners of the Iceland are franchised. We, we will have some Iceland also for starting. But after we're going to sell, the, we're going to give an API key, and everybody will be able to launch business based on that. The thing is that in order to play with the game, you need to have to pay a monthly fee. And this monthly fee is what is filling the Iceland with rewards. The owner of the Iceland decides how much he keeps for himself and how much he reinjects inside the Iceland. So the system is making a circle that is not using our wallet. It's not using our token. So the value of our token is stable. We are not printing. We, we will have to print if we need more liquidity because we're going to have more and more, more ice. But I think it's a pretty smart uh, way to handle the problem of liquidity and uh, depleting the token on the long term, which is a main issue for many, many GameFi games. And about the NFTs, we have seven factions. Each faction has a superpower. Like uh, one faction can swim, one faction can resist a poison. So the people we can rent for NFTs, <laughs> we've worked. So like you're playing, you make some, you find some, some crypto, you can rent an NFT. And then if you rent a red card NFT, then you're more lucky, you find crypto and you make more money when you convert it. There are a lot of uh, things <laughs> that's going on. So we have seven factions, each has a special power, each have a story that is written about 100 pages for each. Uh, we have writ written the, all the stories of the faction, how they were created, who uh, were the guys. And this um, idea that the crypto is, there is a crypto infection that's come from an asteroid, the asteroid blow on the earth, it's make uh, this small crystal go inside the body of people and people have their DNA changing. And some people, they get superpower like Superman. And uh, with the card, the, the NFT, then you can temporarily have the power of these people. So you will have a portfolio of, or, or NFTs, and you will change depending on what you want to do. You want to swim, you take an equipment. You want to be lucky, you take a red card. You want to fight, you take a military. So we, you will change that. And we have a 3D NFT too, which are complete skills. So at the same time, they are like RPG, force, uh, speed, etc. And depending on what you want to do, you can change the 2D NFTs, which are the profile NFTs, and you can change also. You can select a new character, which is going to be a small kid or a big monster, or you can change that. All of that are NFTs, and you can rent them if you don't have the money. So there is a huge, huge economy based on the ISL, on the NFTs. And I just scratched the surface because. When you rent a, a shop, for example, it is stacking. <laughs> when you stack something, you don't. Here we are players. We, we don't want to explain what is stacking to the players. Say, okay, with this shop, you put 10,000 work, and uh, you're going to have this APR. And every month you get uh, more work. It's stacking. But it's actually, you, you rent a shop and you get the benefit of the, the sales of the shop. We, so we translate everything in the game, but it's DeFi, actually. That's really cool. So it sounds like NFTs will uh, represent characters and they'll also represent sort of level up or power ups for those characters, depending on... Yeah, it's kind of booster. Yeah. Boosters, yeah, exactly. And we have pass. The pass is for the DAO because we are going to do... This game is not going to be finished. We are developing forever. 
So we, we will have two kinds of paths, and this path we will be voting right. So we will say, okay, do you want to have more alcohol, <laughs> or do you want to have more bars, or do you want to have more monsters, or do you want to develop more the indoor water swimming and stuff? And people will be able, able to vote with these paths. Very cool. It sounds really interesting and uh, a lot of innovative and unique ways that NFTs are going to be integrated into the game in addition to the use of the cryptocurrencies. So kind of wrapping up, if somebody wants to get involved with Meta Island, how can they do that? Are you guys looking for alpha testers? When will you be looking for alpha testers? If not, what are sort of the next steps and and how can somebody who wants to uh, help you guys out, how can they get involved? Well, the first thing is talking about it, awareness, because we are developing the game. So it's, it's good to follow our Telegram or our Twitter just to know where we are. Because when we're going to go public, we have the maker who's going to launch us. And uh, I know personally the founder, uh, Hatu, who is uh, involved in the game. He's talking with me every month, passionate about uh, Meta Island. So we're going to be pushed. And Neo, of course. Now we are following the project for one year, so in October it's going to be one year. So we, we have friends, we are not alone. So just follow when, when we're going to go public and buy it some, <laughs> because it's going to go like this. And also, just spread the awareness about this project, because there are so much comes around. This project is very solid. I mean, Neo will never invest in, into the, this project if they were, if it was not something that they, they trust 100%. Absolutely. Well, Nicholas, thank you so much for coming to join the pod. I was really excited to chat with you uh, when we first started communicating on Telegram. And when I started to dig into Meta Island and see the, the great graphics and the really cool kind of metaverse that you're trying to build and just kind of incorporating all this experience using new technology, it was really exciting to see obviously writing for Neo News today. I can't wait to continue covering the project. And I look forward to spreading the word as updates are made. So thank you so much for coming to join the podcast. I know it's late over there, so I really appreciate it. It was great great to talk with you. I'm always uh, excited to talk about the project. And uh, thank you for opening this podcast so that I can explain what Meta Island is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming to join. And I look forward to having you join on the podcast again at some point in the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Good day. <laughs> Cheers. Well, what did you think of that conversation? I thought it was really cool to follow the progression of Nicholas's career and how his early experiences in the gaming industry shaped how his perspective of the ownership over Meta Island is enhanced by cryptocurrency-based fundraising in a way that AAA gaming studios and traditional funding couldn't offer. It was also interesting to hear more about his outlook on building a metaverse and that the team is approaching a console PC version of the game over a VR headset concept. And I'm looking forward to seeing how the game theory for players cooperating through shared mutual interests on each of the islands will actually play out. On that note, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Smart Economy podcast. If you liked what you heard and want to support the show, please keep Neo News Today in mind when voting for your Neo Council representative as part of Neo's governance process. We appreciate you and look forward to catching you next time.